All right, thank you, Kim. And thank you everyone for attending this virtual event where the topic today is uh, familiar to most of us um, in this in these new times of hybrid workforce. Some of us are um, already in the office. Some of us are still working remote. In either way, the dynamics have changed a little bit. And um, today's talk will basically go over what are those uh, threats that have emerged due to hybrid work. Anyone else having trouble hearing Michelle? Yeah, Michelle, your um, audio is muted. There we go. Did you hear anything I said? Nope. nope. OK. <laughs> yeah, one of the things from switching from uh, WebEx to this, the mute button is in a different place. OK, now you can hear me. So perfect. Thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, um, familiar topic that we have for um, remote workforce. Um, half of us are probably working in the office now, are back. And at, at whatever point, this is always going to stay hybrid. Um, the percentages are going to change. But what really changes here is the threat model from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, today's topic is more around what has changed. Are there any new threats that have emerged due to this hybrid workforce? How can we keep our organizations and ourselves uh, safer? Uh, what are some of those things that we need to know um, that are different than normal cybersecurity that we talk about or the remote workforce force itself? So I'll go over some of those challenges and I want to highlight some of the newer risks that are out there. And um, you know, I'll, as always, I'll lead with examples. No theory, PowerPoint is just to keep me on track. Uh, for the topics and obviously next steps, what we can do um, to mitigate some of these things and uh, keep safer and how to manage the ever-changing security landscape. Uh, one of those ways is how do we quantify this risk? I get this uh, question all the time. So let's, let's answer those things and feel free to uh, uh, put your questions in the chat as we go through this. I'll be having a look at it every now and then and towards the end, I'll also open it up for some Q&A. Hey, Michelle, you're muted again. Yeah, it's weird. It keeps muting by itself. Thanks for the reminder. Um, let's see when it gets muted. Is it when I'm clicking back and forth? Nope. I don't know. All right. Perfect. OK, so a, remi a reminder for some of those who maybe haven't um, attended my talks. Um, some of my background around cybersecurity comes from my technical um, experience uh, being an ethical hacker. So I'm well grounded with reality on how hackers hack what they do and being a consultant and a an, uh, cybersecurity investigator, uh, I, I look at both sides of things, how attacks happen and how to defend yourself from it. And all organizations have similar uh, problems to a different degree, whether it's you know government, healthcare, education, SMB, small to large, they all have uh, similar issues. Um, so some of those, bigger security threats that we have seen uh, due to this um, work from home type of environment. And these haven't changed much, uh, but they've uh, escalated a lot. Phishing attacks have are still number one, but they're, uh, they've become even more uh, relevant now because people are only seeing the phishing emails. At least before we had a colleague sitting right in front of us, we could ask, hey, did you send this email? Or HR was just right down the hall. We could just walk up to them or meet them um, at lunchtime and stuff. So these things are becoming harder to pick up, the, the social engineering aspect of this, um, because uh, of the lack of those interpersonal um, communications uh, that have been lost uh, due to remote uh, work. 
um, a lot of damage control um, could have been avoided uh, when planning is in place, but sadly it's not. People are now thinking of uh, how to plan for the next breach because breaches are becoming more and more common. Ransomware and all these things almost you know, not a not a day or a week passes by that we don't have a customer reporting a ransomware incident. So we'll we'll talk about that next as well. And cloud has always been one of those things since the advent of cloud. As all, I've always said, and all IT professionals have said, <clears throat> it's the same thing as any network. It's just someone else's network. And a lot of people are saying, okay, it's someone else's problem. Well, guess what? The data is still yours. The exposure is still yours. So it's still your problem to secure the cloud or make sure it is secure, even though you may not have full control over it. Um, and obviously mobile is still um, an issue. Mobile devices and IoT devices, we, we're not even touching those. And IoT now has suddenly become more relevant because we work from home and now our home networks are exposed because we're accessing um, everything in our organizations, whether cloud-based applications or whatnot, through our home. So is our home really secure uh, or is it the same home network that we've always had, you know, the insecure version of it? And I'll give a few examples of my own network in a bit. But one of the things I want to clear out is we, when we talk about the cost of a data breach, it's not the money aspect of it. Uh, I rarely hear an organization talk about uh, these things anymore that, uh, hey, it's, 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 a, it's about budget or it's about um, how much money we're going to lose. Even though there are stats available, I'm showing some of them right now, how much uh, financial impact there is. But that impact is not just monetary theft. It's not just the Bitcoin that they want from you. It's all the other things in that list that the hacker doesn't get. You don't see you know, the legal fees, the lawsuits, the identity theft. For me, the big one is the loss of reputation or business co continuity. Once you lose your reputation, you lose a lot of customers in that process. Uh, you don't want to be the next target or the next Sony. See how these have become part of our English language, the next target. Uh, you know, poor target, they didn't even get hacked. It was their HVAC vendor who got hacked, whose name no one knows. <laughs> so it's it's that piece that I'm more worried about, uh, the intellectual property. Someone steals your trade secrets. You can't put a price on those things. So let's be a little bit more proactive uh, in combating uh, these situations. So let's let's give an example of you know the loss of reputation and all those things I was talking about. Um, Kim, just a quick check. Can you see my browser? Yes, DuckDuckGo. Yeah, yep. perfect. Okay, so here's here's a website, Intel Techniques, that I contribute to as well. Um, and there's a recent ransomware attack that happened uh, by by a group which uh, which posts personal data of companies that refuse to pay ransom. So if you pay the ransom, they win. If you don't pay the ransom, they expose your data. And these are real life snapshots. Instead of me showing you from my hard drive, um, here's a website that actually posted redacted versions of this. Uh, the, these are all sorts of companies, healthcare providers. This is, uh, this is a FICO risk score of uh, this person fully exposed. Uh, their uh, driver's license copies are there. Their passport images uh, are online for the world to see. And, and these are all sorts of companies. There's no one type here. There's HR got exposed. Everyone's W-2 forms for this company were there. And these were universities and colleges. And there's some hospitals in here as well. Uh, but a lot of this data was supposed to be private. Some of this is government data. Some of this is um, healthcare, university. Anything you give to any organization you know, it's eventually going to be public, sadly. Any things you sign, anything that's conf confidential between you and um, the car you buy, the uh, every time you go buy a vehicle, purchase a house, you provide you know, copies of your identification. You think those people are securing it properly? Um, all these HIPAA notices that you sign, uh, like images like this. A few days ago, I went to the doctor took my daughter 
um, to the doctor and they wanted to take pictures. You know, I said it's it's okay to take a picture of uh, the area that's affected, but she wanted to take a picture of her face and I refused. I, I, I raised my privacy concerns and she's like, okay, that's fine. We won't. She's like, our doctor just likes to have a picture of everything. Uh, you, you simply have to refuse because this is what I would show my doctor now. I'm like, okay, these pictures will eventually be online. If you get hit by ransomware and you're probably not doing a very good job at protecting yourself and you're not going to pay the ransom, this stuff is going to be online for me to download and for the world to see. So privacy and security go hand in hand. So know that there's it's, it's a lose-lose battle. You either pay the ransom you lose, you don't pay it, and you get exposed. So this is the new trend that's going on. Uh, they're even posting entire Outlook PST files because they're stealing gigabytes of those things and now have everyone's inbox, everyone's entire email history, sent items. Uh, so a lesson here is don't you know send sensitive stuff through emails. A new trend that I've been picking up now is when I send sensitive files, it's, it's either a shared folder or an expiring link to um, uh, a file that you you have to download. It's no longer an, an attachment so that when the bad guys actually get um, that said the PST files or copies of my email, all it has are links to my passport or uh, a sensitive document and not the actual document itself. So you know these new tactics call for new strategies uh, to to protect yourself. But yeah, this is what's happening now. No longer are they asking for, this is extortion. This is flat out extortion. Pay up or else we will expose your files. Before it was pay up or we lock your, your systems. So the solution before was, uh, hey, make a backup. And I've said this hundreds of times. I'm like, if you have a backup, you're, you're fine, you're safe. But you're no longer safe if, if they have data exfiltration. So now we need to care about data exfiltration. Make sure the data stays with us and doesn't get in the wrong hands. And these are similar challenges um, with with working remote um, and you know putting stuff in the cloud. When the cloud gets hacked, it's just someone else's computer. For an, for an hacker, that's uh, that's no different. Hacking your network versus Microsoft's or someone else's. If, if you're using shared passwords and no MFA, then it's uh, extremely easy uh, for them to do it. And you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of challenges that come with working remote specifically, um, because you're no longer in your networks anymore. You're using your own Wi-Fi, and securing your Wi-Fi now becomes that much more important. Um, you know, back in the days uh, when I was, you know, learning ethical hacking and stuff, I used to test on you know neighbors, whoever's Wi-Fi I used to catch signal to. Uh, sitting in a coffee shop at an airport, getting bored, pick, you know, open my laptop, see all these SSIDs, and people had weak passwords, extremely weak passwords, and cracking tools can crack them in a matter of seconds. So make sure you you're protecting your home network, your wireless, and your LAN, um, at least with the bare minimum, and you're locking your workstations. Uh, because when you're not around your computer, maybe someone else is, you know, you, your kids can, um, you know, press the wrong key, send something you're not supposed to send, delete files, uh, all that stuff. It's no longer a work uh, environment where it, there's more physical security than your home. Somebody steals your laptop from your home, that's more likely than stealing it from the office. Uh, make sure you have full disk encryption on. These are really little things, you know, BitLocker, FileVault, Veracrypt. These things don't take more than a few minutes to turn on and organization wide. It's just a script that runs to, to do that. We've helped many customers just turn on BitLocker on thousands of computers by creating a script and just rolling it out uh, in a smooth process. Uh, and obviously real time backups, because nowadays every minute counts. You, you can't afford to lose your data. Um, and passwords, I mean, uh, I can have enough uh, conversation around passwords, and I mean, there's there's no excuse not to use a password manager. I mean, period. I'm I'm done with uh, people having 
people have longer passwords, more complex passwords, unique passwords, just use the password manager. It's going to make your life so much easier. And and I know it's tough. Even I struggle with this with my own family. I'm probably um, in the huge minority when it comes to using password managers, but the, there's no compromise to this. And people who say it's it's hard to use password managers, let me give you a real quick example of uh, not just password managers, but the full full life cycle using complex passwords, long passwords, password managers, and um, multi-factor authentication. Whether using something like this, where it's a um, let's let's actually show you. So demo.duo.com is a great example um, where you see what a push notification looks like. If you want to show you know the, anyone else in your organization. It's literally as simple as putting in your username, password, um, either manually filling this in or through a password manager, clicking sign in and say, send me a push notification. And your phone will now have that second factor. And if it has uh, biometrics enabled on it, facial recognition or thumbprint, then that's your third factor. Now it becomes multi-factor authentication. Click on this, approve, and that's it. Whatever you're trying to log in here, just goes through whether it's vpn or outlook or uh, your windows machine it's that easy but let me show you my own account here so when i log into any of my accounts let's see how quick this is just to show people that this is really easy so if i'm logging into my twitter account and let me show you my password here uh, the moment I hit login, it auto populates because I've signed into my password manager. And let's have a look at my password here. Uh, get ready for taking screenshots because here you go. Here's my password. And this is not you know, my account. This is a alias account I've created for this demo. But this is over 50 characters. There's a rolling code here and you have 25 seconds left to use this code. Uh, and you have that much time to type in this password as well. Uh, so I'm not worried about anyone hacking into this because when I log into this, this auto populates. And before I turn to the next screen, um, I have a YubiKey, which is a hardware key connected to my laptop, and it's going to ask me for it. So let's go through the process. This auto populates 50 character password. I press login. It says touch your YubiKey here. Let me go ahead and reach out. I touch the YubiKey and I'm signed in all the way through two-factor authentication, the strongest type, um, MFA enabled. Uh, the YubiKey I'm using here is, uh, just so you know, YubiKey, what, what a YubiKey looks like. It's a hardware device. This is the exact one that I'm using right now, USB-C version. Plug it in, touch it on the side. It's that simple. You don't have to have this. You can have the Authenticator app or push notifications whatever it is, any two-factor is better than no two-factor authentication. So it's it's literally that easy. Um, challenges with collaboration. We, we see a new form of attack that's coming out where since you're not physically present, um, collaboration becomes harder, um, talking to people face-to-face. -face. So let's make sure we're not falling for you know all the common scams that come through email or or social media account breaches um, or our collaboration platforms being breached make sure it's an end-to-end -end encrypted platform with mfa and everything in place and this is where education and policy also uh, comes through why do we see the spread of these scams these um, medical scams or uh, the, the checks that we're getting, all these uh, things, we're getting all these calls, emails, messages, SMSs. Uh, it's become more and more because of this, because we're not in front of people um, anymore. And this comes with policy as well. So let me demonstrate to you what I mean by policy. One of the policies that people should be aware of is don't use your person, your organization email address for social media. Don't mix the two. So an example here is I have a breach database um, of um, LinkedIn, and this is a 2013 breach. And let me search through this 
data data breach with at illinois.gov anyone with this email address so you know, it's a corporate email address in the linkedin users txt file and let's see how many illinois.gov employees or email addresses signed up for a linkedin a social media account using you know this this email address let me press enter and the list goes on and on and on these are all the email addresses that should have never been on social media but but they are and let's see how many there are let's do a word count of this to see how many corporate email addresses were there 2241 and this to me is unacceptable use a gmail hotmail yahoo whatever use a junk email address for junk accounts for social media accounts not your corporate uh, email addresses because what happens now is this gets breached which it did 2013 this is a long time ago and now these email addresses have passwords which are also there i'm not showing them right now but they're all breached and what are the chances that these people use the same password for their outlook account as they are for their linkedin account i can tell you from experience extremely high because um, people are not using password managers so your breaches are not in your hands anymore they're in the hands of social media accounts all the hundreds and thousands of accounts that get breached all the time and you know just the medical side of things uh, you know advocate medical uh, healthcare got breached and they got fined one and a half million dollars which really made no difference to them but how they got breached here was a laptop that was stolen somewhere in this article it mentions that that um, a, a doctor left his laptop in the car and it did not have full disk encryption on it and it says in the article there was no encryption on the laptop and the attacker basically just took the hard drive out put it in a new computer and the entire health records were breached because of one laptop that did not have one little checkbox called uh, you know full disk encryption um, file vault or what is it um, bit locker uh, sorry enabled on it that could have saved them 1.5 million dollars and a whole bunch of embarrassment which now people take them as an example and the u.s department of health has this thing called their wall of shame um, where they post how many breaches have happened in the healthcare industry i've just filtered this down to illinois and all the recent 2021 breaches and there are a lot and not all of these are healthcare directly but they're related to hipaa like the cna financial corporation they had a health plan they got breached and what's interesting is the last um, column here where it says how they got breached and this kind of shows you you know what hackers are doing it's either email or you know network servers shared files or um, you know laptops that were stolen from someone else so we need to be looking at these simple methods for these pretty large hacks that are going on i mean you can probably see the theme here it's nothing new that I'm telling um, you guys here. It's it's the same theme. It's just the focus now is on these things because it's so much easier. It's those little things that count. And that's all cybersecurity takes multiple layers, layers upon layers of security. It's just someone needs to manage these um, correctly. Um, the, the last challenge I, I see here is you know, BYOD, which is bring your own device. Um, in, in the past that uh, only a few organizations were doing this, um, really the Silicon Valley style ones, a hey, bring your own device and, you know, put everything on it. N nowadays, it's, it's more common because we're working from home. We want to use our own personal laptops, our own personal devices to, for better connectivity. But then at the same time, are we making sure that we on our personal devices we have stuff like content filtering ad blockers are we protecting from malware because when we're using our company issued laptops all these things are taken care of um, in our home networks and on our personal devices we're probably not doing any of this we're not doing patches and upgrades uh, as often as we should um, you know a lot of our malware protection is obsolete uh, ad blockers uh, ad blockers go a pretty long way so I'll, I'll show you 
my own ad blocker. So I'm in my home network right now. I'm using a VPN. And here's another myth of VPNs. And VPNs cause a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth delays and stuff. I, I hope you're getting the streaming fine. My voice and videos is OK um, because I am on a VPN connection right now. So let's quickly look at that. Yep, I'm on Proton VPN currently. So ad blockers are also malware blockers um, and organizations usually use them. But at home, you can simply choose um, basic ad blockers. So here's a little demo we can all do together. If you all go to chicagotribune.com and let me refresh this page so you know that this is not cached or anything. If you go to your own browser at home or in the office for that matter, go to chicagotribune.com, you're not going to see a similar page to this or the same page as this. You're going to see a bar over here with an ad, an ad over here where there's a gap in the space. Um, you, you're going to see a whole bunch of other ads where there's like little gaps of nothing over here and even on the bottom. And just to demonstrate that, I, I can't undo this because I have a network based ad blocker running here, but I can open the same page in something called browserling.com, which is a browser on the internet on someone else's computer without any of the ad blockers or virus protection. So it's sort of used for sandboxing. So if I open that same page there, mimicking a Firefox connection, I suddenly see there's an ad placement up here on the right. It came through more ads and the whole page is it's actually quite slow because of these ads. And you see a whole bunch of other ads in places that should have been blocked. So this is so what it's doing is sometimes the ads here are actually malware based ads. You click on it, a whole bunch of things pop up, things get installed, uh, a Yahoo bar or whatever gets installed, and a lot of malware and adware gets installed when you do this. And besides the fact you're being tracked anyway, so privacy and security both uh, play a role here. And while you're blocking ads, you're also blocking you know, a lot of malware, command and control type of things, uh, a lot of the defaults. Like just on this page, my network is blocking the ads, but then my browser-based ad blocker is blocking 41 different elements on this page. Yet I see the page fine. What are those 41 different elements? There's You can see all these little websites here, advertising websites and trackers and there's Cloudflare. There's, there's so many other things on running on this website. Everything's being blocked. I don't need all of that just on one simple web page. So these are the little things you, you and I can do to kind of uh, you know minimize some of the, the the threat levels because today it's an ad, tomorrow it's malware, and then there's content filtering built into these type of things. So it's it's extremely easy to do mitigation techniques like this. You know, in the corporation we use you know something like Cisco Umbrella. Uh, to perform the exact same thing where the admin gets a view of what's being accessed in the environment, uh, what threats were stopped, malware, wh what uh, exact devices were infected so that we can go there and remediate some of those things, um, and what operating systems, locations the machine was using, um, visibility. So this is all about visibility. You can only stop things when you have more visibility uh, to this. So that's another element that is more rampant because of work from home. We have less visibility. The IT admin cannot see a lot of the threats, and if you can't see it, you can't stop it. Uh, we mentioned, um, you know, I mentioned phishing as the largest threat vector, still is, still going on. We need to change the way we do phishing. Uh, the video on demand style trainings and the the no before type of wombat security, all that 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 all is good. That's still required, but we need to do something above and beyond the baseline because it's not working. <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest. If it doesn't work, you you need to try something better. Uh, you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And this is what I see when I ask people, do you have a phishing program in place? Oh yeah, we do. We we have you know 
no before we have no before or wombat or uh, wiser there's so many companies out there that that do this but my answer my question is is it working uh, are the phishing attacks still going through are people still clicking has the click rate gone down are they more aware uh, half the time the answer is i don't know uh, the other time, oh, yes, it is. Oh, really? Let's do a pen test. Every time I've done a phishing pen test, I have succeeded without fail. It's uh, it's a, maybe a pat on the back for me, but it's, I mean, it, it's not good for the client because phishing attacks are still working. So let's do something different here. So yeah, let's continue those video on demand style trainings and then let's add quarterly phishing campaigns and mix it up a little bit you know start with a baseline then some intermediate level phishing attacks then spear phishing which is what the hackers are doing today so mimic the hackers uh, go all out test it go back and then fix it uh, there's no point of testing it if you're not fixing it so i'm a very action oriented person if you're not taking action you're wasting your own time you're wasting your money you're wasting everyone's time uh, so let's let's start taking action and let's you know let's stop just putting more products and tools and services into our networks um, so you know have debriefing emails uh, one of the things i've seen positive in in our company as well and in, in other organizations that we have these positive vibes around something that's usually a negative thing that oh my god you clicked on an email it's not the end of the world everyone clicks on it let's turn it into something positive let's let's gamify it or a lessons learned email or let's let's show everyone there's no embarrassment there's no blame game let the leaders come out and say hey i fell for this so please don't fall for this when the leaders in the organization can fall for it everyone else feels a little bit more comfortable and then they come out and say hey i clicked on this too but i didn't report it because i was either embarrassed or there was going to be some repercussions so maybe there's that element find out make everything a learning opportunity and you know a, a, a neat idea i saw at a company was they were giving gift cards out uh, so the first few people who reported got a 25 dollars gift card from from hr or the, the first few people who implemented mfa because mfa rollout is, is tough for the organization um, so everyone gets a 25 dollars gift card if you do it within a month or whatever make up rules make it make it easier for the people and make them want to do it don't enforce it upon them because when you enforce it on people they will bypass it somehow they will bypass mfa they will bypass uh, your phishing programs they will not have fun so uh, let's make the purpose here um, you know implementing what's more secure for the organization uh, some of the gaps that you know we've we've all seen in you know work from home security um, is so, the things I mentioned is is the slow rate of adoption um, to to change in general. You know, people don't like using VPNs, so they open up uh, RDP ports. I do vulnerability scans all the time, and I see remote desktop protocol RDP port is open to a computer in your organization accessible from the world put it behind a VPN uh, it's yeah sure it's a hassle it's one more step in the way but it's it's it doesn't take much to do it it's that balance between convenience and security what are you willing to give up uh, there has to be a balance again um, so do those little things because they go a very long way MFA there's, there's so much resistance to MFA till today I don't think I have an account that does not have MFA. Those that do, they don't offer it. That's why there's no MFA. But everywhere there is a possibility, that's the first thing I do. Just just click on it because I don't want to get hacked, or at least I don't want to be that person who said, oh, I got hacked because I didn't do my due diligence. So there there should be no regrets for at least you know the, the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and use technology for productivity. That's what it was made for. You know, cloud storage, collaboration, BYOD. Th there's ways to make these things easier and use that. The purpose of technology is not to make things harder or, or to put, you know, things in the way. It's, it's productivity. And we can all find ways to be more productive while working remote. Um, I have, there's, I, I utilize all these technologies to my advantage while securing them. So it is doable. And it is not the responsibility of the IT department um, security in general. It is 
a collective responsibility because if if you're exposing something online um, everyone else is there to exploit it um, so you are part of security every single one of the organization uh, is so what what can we do to kind of mitigate some of these things um, you know we, we've discussed a lot of the problems and some of the solutions among uh, along with those problems as well most of them are just little things it's you know it's it's less product more strategy it's more mfa rather than saying hey you need to do or you need microsoft or you need this password manager or bit you know, it's not about that it's just just do what it takes for a more secure environment it's so it's more strategy and then executing that strategy and the focus now has to be on privacy as well we've been focusing on security so much that the bad guys have kind of morphed and said, OK, fine, you're not going to pay the ransom. We're going to expose you because apparently exposing exposes your privacy and that matters more to you than just the money. Like for a HIPAA violation, Advocate Healthcare got fined one and a half billion dollars. That was a, a, a slap on their wrist. That was nothing. That was probably their hours or days worth of, of, of income. And they kept doing it. They got fined multiple times. All these healthcare companies, they keep getting fined. It's, it's not solving the problem. Uh, so let's let's focus on other things, reputational damage, continuity, and all those things. That's a focus on privacy now. And to bring everything you know under one umbrella, if management is the issue, which which I have seen that there's there's too many moving parts, then you know embrace uh, something like a VC, so a CISO itself, if you can't afford to hire a, a chief information security officer, you know outsource one, get a virtual one, or have a, a portion of your security managed. Uh, we manage so many aspects of uh, our IT anyways. You know, cloud is one of those things. Even physical security, there's the security guards are not part of your organization. There's, uh, there, there's those are outsourced. Then why not cybersecurity? And, you know, this is becoming a, a big trend now uh, I've seen. And that's why we've also moved in this direction uh, as well. And then, you know, how do we make sense of all these things you know prioritize things it has to come from you know top down a financial risk metric whatever impacts your organization the most whether it's your reputation whether it's your fear of ransomware or um, whatever those reasons are let's put them in order of financial risk not just a technical risk because far too long we've been having and i'm guilty of this too I've been having the conversation from a technical perspective because that's the way I think. I'm like, oh, you're going to get hacked. Your passwords are going to get exposed. At the end of the day, the, the answer is, so what? And, and it's hard to answer. And uh, one of the examples I have here, uh, there's a website called breachdirectory.tk, and there's many websites like this. If I put in, you know, Jane Doe, at gmail.com something i just you know can uh, something very common it's an actual email address it exists and i look it up and it shows me the password uh, they're, they're masked some of them one two three four you can probably guess what the other two stars are after that or something like this passwords is not an issue anymore anyone can get passwords like this for example one qz and a bunch of stars uh, to me an ethical hacker i know exactly what this password is look at your keyboard you know, start from one Q A Z. The next digits should be two W S X because that's what it says on my keyboard. There's a hash of this right here. I don't even need to crack hashes anymore. I just Google them. Let's put this in Google. The first result I get here, there's the password. That's the cracked version of the hash, which is exactly what I guessed. So passwords are no longer an issue. Anyone can Google them uh, right now. So we need to change how we see security, it's not just about protecting the technical side of things, it's the financial risk metric that goes with it. Uh, with that, um, I'll, uh, I'll have um, Eric uh, hop on real quick um, to kind of walk us through what we have on offer today. Um, before I get Eric on, um, one of the things we offer to combat something like this is our VCSO offering. And l let me get to how we got about this. Uh, we offered these things ad hoc uh, initially, and we still do. Uh, and all, the, all of these things are good. Some of the questions I got were, how can we uh, measure 
Uh, is there a tool to measure risk and security? This was one of the questions I got from uh, the attendees. Yeah, there are tools to measure security risk individually. One of them is a vulnerability assessment right here. Uh, you do the assessment, you get a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a 4,000 page report on every single port and vulnerability that's there. And then, you know, our job is to refine it into a 10 page report and show you the top risks. That's one tool. There's pen tests. That's another tool uh, targeted to one aspect of security, either wireless or external or web application. Um, security risk assessment is probably the best tool. It assesses all of your risk overall cybersecurity related risk. Um, so all of these individual individually are great scope of works to perform for individual assessments and tools to analyze parts of it. But when we look at the bigger picture, this is what a VC so sees. And if you are responsible for security in your organization, this is what you should be looking at at a bare minimum, at a very high level. This is a two year project plan that 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 I do for managing uh, security for customers and this mentions most of the things i went over whether it's a security assessment every quarter we review security so that we're on track we do quarterly vulnerability scans again you can do these one-off or have them um, in, in a regular fashion like this we track stuff we fish regularly and then correct uh, whatever the outcomes there were, whatever the recommendations were from multiple assessments. One of the big things is documentation, incidents response planning and policy documents. We make sure they're in place. If you don't have them, I'll create them for you. Sit with you know, the IT leaders and um, uh, the executives and create those documents so that they're, they're worth, they're valuable, and they're required by a lot of uh, compliances and um, nowadays, cybersecurity insurance insurance comes and says, hey, we're going to jack up your rates because you don't have these things in place. You don't have uh, your uh, InfoSec policy in place or you're not doing regular scans or pen tests. So these things suddenly become relevant in the bigger uh, scheme of things. And then when you look at all of this, suddenly you realize, yeah, this is not an IT issue only. This requires its own uh, department, so to speak. Eric, you want to jump into what here we have to offer moving forward? Maybe Eric's not online. Feel free to jump in, but I'll, I'll touch upon this um, as well. So one of the aspects here was quantifying your risk how we basically achieve something like that. So it's important to put a dollar amount next to what we talk about. So we talk about, you know, the NIST controls. Okay, each NIST control that we do, how does it map to real security threats? Uh, so we do something called an impact analysis, where we look at some of your very high level financial data, you know, your revenue, your, your profits, what industry you are in, and come up with a chart like this where it says where it kind of gives you visibility into if you thought ransomware was your biggest problem so i'm back yeah perfect go ahead you can take over from here this is the chart i'm basically showing them but go yeah. ahead there so you know michelle hit on a couple of key things right um one of the big things here is that you know, security is not just about the technology or the solutions that you implement. And so what we need to do is we need to approach this problem in a couple different facets. And one of the big ones, if you're leadership and, you know, I assume most of the people on here are either in the IT world, the IT department, or maybe not business, the, the business side of the organization, CFO seat, CEO seat. Um, and there's often a clash there between the IT department asking for new tools, new services, new things, and the business not always understanding and being able to quantify what the risk is and what they're getting in return for those tools. So really with this impact analysis, what we're doing is this is a tool that we've, we've brought on board into our organization. It's developed by some economists out of UIC. And really the concept here is they built an algorithm to go out and basically evaluate and quantify the risk 
to your organization around some specific key factors. And so what they've done is they've built this model and they look at the type of industry you're in, the type of work that you do, the type of exposure and how these risks affect you and your specific organization. And then they built this model and they are incredibly detailed. I mean, one of the examples um, that, uh, that this tool does is that when it goes and estimates the cost of a security breach on you. They factor in everything to the minute detail, everything to the stamps it's gonna cost to send out letters to your clients to let them and notify them that you've been breached. So what they've done here and what this tool allows us to do and this impact analysis is a very high level. Um, it's an entry level into this, this program and looking at this tool, but what they've done is they've identified eight key types of security breaches. You'll see them there on the left, the PII breach, the IP compromise, denial of service, ransomware, digital fraud, hacktivist act, attack, um, digital vandalism, and then a bucket for kind of other. And what this example here that, that we're showing on the screen is an example for an organization such as Mindsight, an, an IT consultant, and it quantifies the risk for us. We're not really storing a ton of um, you know, ransomware isn't a huge factor to us as an organization. I know it's out there in the news, um, but we don't run a lot of systems. We work on your systems, right? So from an organization standpoint, ransomware doesn't hold as much of a threat to us, but digital fraud is huge for us. This is the concept that kind of like that target attack, um, the ability or for us to be susceptible to an attacker mimicking us, pretending to be us, infiltrating one of our clients' environments um, posing as Mindsight is a huge threat, right? Likewise, PII breach and IP compromise are huge threats to us, right? Um, we have information on all of our clients, whether that's passwords, um, where your systems are, all of those details that a hacker could take advantage of and that, you know, like we, you know, always talk about the target attack was, was through a supply chain vendor, through an HVAC vendor that attacked their environment that's a huge risk to us as an organization. And so what this tool does is it helps us quantify what that risk is in actual dollars. Um, we put in some generic, uh, you know, this is a model, but we put in some very basic information about your organization, um, you know, revenue, um, profit margin, some of those things. We'll do that with you as part of this assessment. But what it does is it goes through that algorithm and it tells you where your risk is and, and how it affects you, right? So what you can use this tool for and how we use this tool is we use it to model what the effect is of implementing certain security solutions are. So for example, this doesn't take into effect that we've implemented 2FA or multi-factor wherever we can, which would mitigate some of this risk. This helps you build a strategy and be able to look at that solution that you're contemplating um, implementing and determine does it a, does it protect and mitigate risk in the categories that are most significant to me, to my business, to my industry, right? Another great example of looking at this, if we were an e-commerce business, we'd see a denial of a service attack have a much more significant bottom line um, effect in, in our overall risk because as an e-commerce site, if you're a victim of a denial of service, those are all sales that you can't process. Those are clients that can't hit your website. That's all reputation. Um, it's all of those things that factor into that. But for again, for Mindsight, denial of service has a bit of a of a of a uh, impact. If our website where you open tickets to 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 uh, you know get service or work done on your environment, if that's down, we're going to have some reputation risk, right? There's other channels you can communicate with us, but that would have some effect on us, right? So um, I'm actually going to pull up another example of this report, Michelle, to kind of walk through this a little bit. Um, so give me one second to share some content. And in, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or we can talk as well. Let's see. Identify my screens. Michelle, let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, I can see it. So this is the the um, the full impact valuation. We're offering this to everyone in attendance on this meeting free of cost. We'll sit down with you. Um, you'll provide that information. Um, it's it's really only about a 15 minute 
Um, like I said, the information is very high level, um, but we can build out this model that shows what the risk to your organization is for each of these different types of attacks. And so in this example, like I said, I kind of modeled this off of an organization like Mindsight. We see the actual dollar and cents that this tool uh, calculates through its al algorithms of what that attack would worst case, near worst case scenario would be. Right. So you can just see the power of this. If you're trying to talk to the, the business leaders and maybe you are the CFO and you're trying to get your arms wrapped around, hey, I have the, I, you know, I'm, I'm being presented this proposal to implement the security solution and it cost X amount of dollars. Here you can get a, a general model of how much risk that one will mitigate and, and determine if it's the right thing for your organization. Obviously, deploying something in our case, you know, we do have ransomware protection in, but going investing a large investment in ransomware protection for an organization like ours doesn't make a lot of financial sense. So this is where we can get a more educated, more knowledgeable, more quantified strategy for our security. So, um, you know, the report goes into some other details, describes what these types of attacks are. This impact valuation, like I said, we're offering it free of cost. We'd love to sit down with you. It'd be Michelle or myself that goes through and helps you fill out this information and generate this report. Um, obviously, there's there's more advanced levels to this. Um, you know, our, our more advanced deployments, clients are actually using this to model, hey, how much risk do I mitigate if we implement this solution? Doesn't care what the solution is, it's more about categories, but they can see, hey, here's what our strategy is today. Here's where we, where we see our risk is and quantifying it. And over time, as we develop and implement new security, we can see that risk start to, to, to decline. So we can see that we're having an actual effect on protecting our environment and have it in a quantifiable form. Um, we're also, this is a great thing if you're a private equity firm or you work with a private equity firm to get a baseline across multiple organizations to see how they compare to one another and where the opportunities are um, to mitigate risk and a larger scale and have a set standard that you can use to qualify that and quantify that across multiple organizations. So definitely, um, you know, a ton of value here. We can go into it in much more detail on one-on-one -on -one sessions. Anybody who's interested, by all means, reach out to your account executives, reach out to my, Michelle or myself. We'd love to sit down and go through this in deeper detail with you. So I think that's it for me, Michelle. Um, anything I missed there you want to cover? No, while I have you on the call, there's a question um, that was in uh, uh, the, the sign-up sheet. Um, one was about the buy-in for InfoSec programs to the organization. I think we covered that pretty well yeah. with something like this. It's um, it's a cat west to And to that's exactly, forward. you know, for me, if I'm in the, the, the CIO, the IT director, this is a way I can communicate with the business at large and get their buy-in to understand why I want to implement this solution, why, what the potential risk is and why it's important for us to make these changes, right? Or maybe not, maybe, you know, implementing something doesn't really make sense, doesn't mitigate risk in this model. It's a reason for you to also check your strategy and make sure that you're deploying those dollars the most effective. None of us have unlimited budgets, and this is a way to help steer that. Yeah, the other thing, um, the other question is, uh, which just came in the chat here. Let me read it out. Um, are there any pre uh, pre evaluation tools or surveys we can use to gauge our standing? And this, there are a ton of tools yeah. out there that will will give you. Uh, a security scorecard, you know, and that's really what's important to me when I look at this impact valuation. It's not one of those tools that that just gives you a scorecard. Michelle's hit on it a couple of times. Frameworks are your friend. They're the things that you want to use to evaluate yourself, um, and and they they've been defined by industry standards, um, and they're constantly being developed to help make sure that you're on that that path. Um, a lot of the vendors, you know, whether it's uh, antivirus, anti-malware tools, will offer free tools like that. I think they have some value, but to be honest, a lot of them are driven to drive sales, right? Um, I want something that is really impartial, that is about the actual process and procedure of securing my organization. And that's what frameworks stand for to me. Um, that's really, you know, one of the things I liked about this impact evaluation is that it wasn't developed by security organization. It was developed by economists. 
right? Um, because there's a real economic impact. This is a drain on the economy. And they realized that the people that really control the financial budgets in IT, there was a disconnect in them understanding the risk here. And so being able to bridge that gap is really where this tool comes into play. So. Yeah, one other question for you was about remote patch management. Um, how do you do that in a remote workforce environment? Yeah, I mean, obviously that challenge is just uh, amplified in the last year with all the remote work. Um, you know, there are there are, you, there are tools that have been around for a long time that have made some advancements in doing this. You know, the category of the, the uh, mobile device management is extended to being just something used to manage mobile phones. It's being um, used to manage full operating systems. Um, Microsoft, obviously most of us are probably using Microsoft as our operating system platform and organizations. Microsoft's Intune platform is, is made a ton of advancements in being able to patch, control, and manage devices that aren't on the corporate network. There's a clear understanding that that's the way work is going in the future, and they've, they've made that. Now, there are also third-party solutions from other organizations like Manage Engine, et cetera. Um, but that hurdle isn't the same hurdle it used to be with the on-prem WSSA server and patching. Um, but looking at some of these cloud-based tools, uh, mobile device management, and then the new term mobile application management, those two suites of products are, are well um, capable of meeting that challenge today. Yeah, one other question was around instance tracking and response templates. What are the best places or and or tools to monitor that activity to satisfy the minimum requirements by compliance. Something like that is, you know, uh, it depends on what that compliance is, what those minimum requirements are. But when it comes to incidence response and tracking, you must have monitoring tools in place, logging in place, because the entire concept of IR instance response is looking at logs. If you're not retaining logs long term, there is no instance response because we've been in situations where we've invited IR teams to come in and respond to an incident. Um, and those logs were only there for Windows systems or other servers for 24 hours or a day or two. By the time the team came in, uh, they didn't have enough logs to go through all that stuff. So you must have the infrastructure first, which is the log management, and then the monitoring tools to alert you when something happens. Because when the bad guys are in your network, they're usually there for months at a time, and that's how they exfiltrate all these terabytes of data that does not happen overnight. But if you have no tools to, to monitor those activities, anomalies, and why is a one gig file being you know exported out that's not normal that's an anomaly something should inform you and there's a whole bunch of tools depending on what vendor you already have or don't have um, you can either introduce one uh, system in in place or fine-tune your existing tools to inform you of events like this and then comes instance response most organizations are not mature enough to have their own instance response teams because they're not you know large enterprises with cybersecurity teams in place so that's a field that's usually outsourced and due diligence is done beforehand. And that's what we're here for, to set the baseline so that if an incident happens, the, the damage is minimized because you can't prevent it completely. You, what you can do is make it ineffective. So an incident happens and the hacker's like, you know, crap, we got nothing. We didn't get the data. We didn't get passwords. We didn't get root access. We didn't get anything. We breached the organization, but the instance, if, uh, you know, the effectiveness was minimized part of because all the assessments you did, you, you minimize the top risks, the impact evalu evaluation results that you see on the screen right now. You focus on those things first so that your impact to a breach is minimized next to nothing. There are so many good examples, which I didn't show. I, I should have shown examples like LastPass got breached once, a password manager company. Nothing happened. They didn't really get breached. One of their plugins got uh, compromised or whatever. Nothing happened. No passwords were, were compromised. The company was still around, and it actually strengthened their security, saying, look, we got breached too, yet it had no impact on us. So stuff like that, that's where you want to be eventually. Yeah, and the, the one thing I'll say about the, the logging, the incident, you know, it, SIEM is a huge category. Like Michelle said, there are a bunch of solutions out there. But bringing that stuff in-house, unless you've got the talent, the technical time, and the manpower to manage systems like that, it can be, um, it can be difficult. 
right? Um, they can be noisy, uh, takes a while to tune them. And really all of those frameworks, they don't say just do the logging. They say, you know, logging is required, but they also want somebody to be checking and reviewing that. And so that takes a level of knowledge and experience too, that we really find those systems lead themselves to, um, to as a service solutions. So really find that to be the best way to implement that and get the value, not just checking off a box that you have a seam solution in place or you have a logging mechanism in place. You know, at the end of the day, you know, there is, a, you, you know, you could approach security by just checking off the box to make sure you're going to do a thing. But I think most people want to do the right thing. They don't want to get breached. They want to make sure that they're aware when something anomalous is going on, right? That, you know, it is about how you execute this and, and do you have the, the right person, the right team, the right set of solutions so that you are getting that knowledge and you're taking the right and correct action. So, um, I think Seam really leads itself to as a service and that logging because um, it, because it's a challenge to keep those people on staff and to have knowledge and skill to manage those systems. So something to think about there um, if you're you're going down that path. So um, we're at the top of the hour, past the top of the hour. Oh, yep. All right. So Any Eric, what, what do people do if they want to reach out to get this evaluation, um, the impact analysis done and yeah. reach out to, more, to find more about the VCs offering? Yeah, so by all means, if you're interested, reach out to us. Um, I believe we're sending out an email um, after this that'll have our contact information. Send an email to Michelle, myself. Uh, um, if you have an account rep with Mindsight, you're already a, a, an existing client. Was, obviously, you can reach out to your account executive to get that set up. Uh, again, this doesn't take a ton of time. We're not going to, you know, this isn't a, a you know, multi-hour engagement. This is a, a real quick conversation that we can dive in deeper. Um, I implore all of you to take advantage of it. Um, and let's see what it what it says. And and uh, and we'll go from there. But that email that comes out after this event will have our contact information so you can reach out to us. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And as always, reach out for any inquiries or follow ups or anything you want clarification on. Um, reach out to myself or any one of our teams and we'll be more than willing to set up a follow up call to discuss your um, needs or requirements. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time today. Appreciate it.